So thank you very much for inviting me here to give this keynote speech. I'm, I'm really excited because the, the whole format of this Yale Job Market Tour is really exciting. Also great to get to, to know the two of you or to see you again, Raul. So the two of us have met already three and a half years ago at a, an urban economics conference in Philadelphia. So it's, it's nice to catch up. And also personally for me, it's nice to see that two thirds of the most promising labor economics PhD students are doing stuff in my field. So I need to keep this in mind when it comes to, to negotiating about resources for my department. Um, this is what I'm presenting today is joint work with Andreas Menzi, who is uh, sitting here in the audience, and um, Matthias Wrede from University of Erlangen Nürnberg. And it connects nicely to, to my strand of research on um, um, urban labor markets and uh, the benefits from urban labor markets, but this time from a different angle that especially Andreas brought in um, from the perspective of the housing market. And I think it's interesting for you because it really shows how you can um, exploit IAB data to the fullest um, to zoom into cities and look at speci specifically how residents in cities, how they live and how they work. Um, so this is a paper about urban labor markets. We, especially in urban labor economics, we know that cities provide people with opportunities on the labor market. So there's the urban wage premium. Um, that's really an, a phenomenon all around the world that there's an elasticity of wages, of nominal wages with respect to um, city size of around 4%. So doubling city size increases wages by around 4%. About half of this is selection. So more able more, um, people sort themselves into cities. But the other half of this effect um, is productivity. Working and living in cities makes the same person more productive. And so we see the cities are growing. The share of people who lives in cities and who works in cities is growing steadily all, all around the world. Especially in Germany, this also causes problems because cities are getting overcrowded. So urban labor markets, urban housing markets, are getting tighter and tighter. And so especially for people with lower incomes, it's really difficult to find an apartment, to find um, a place to live inside of a bigger city. And so this is something that has been acknowledged by governments around the world. And one tool to mitigate this problem is social housing. So governments around the world provide low-income families, low-income households, with subsidized housing. Um, the average among OECD countries is 7%. So 7% of all dwellings in OECD countries are social housings. But there's a huge variation when you compare countries. Uh, sorry. So the countries where traditionally social housing is extremely pre prevalent um, are the Netherlands and Austria. And for example, in Vienna is a prime example where around or almost half of all dwellings are subsidized dwellings. Um, Germany and also America, for example, are, far, um, are much further down this distribution. So in America, only 3.5% of dwellings are social housing dwellings, are subsidized dwellings. So this is around half of the OECD average. And Germany is even lower with 2.7% of all dwellings being um, social rental dwellings. Now, this is already something we should think about from the German perspective, and this share is also declining. So when you think, when you go back to 2006, the onset of the, of the, the boom on the labor market and in the economy, uh, when the, this huge wave of migration into cities started, we used to have more than two, uh, two million um, social housing um, dwellings. And this number decreased almost by 50% to the recent date. So we really disinvested in social housing. I'm, I'm telling you something about the mechanism behind this later on. It's not that social housing dwellings are getting destroyed or um, demolished. Um, it's, it's simply they, they stopped being social housing dwellings after a certain time, and we simply didn't build new ones after that. So social housing, especially in Germany, seems to be something um, not, not very high on the agenda. 
And people are app apparently are skeptic against social housing. So when you look in the media, you always see that especially the residents that are not in need of social housing are against further construction of social housing dwellings. There are several reasons for that. Um, one is that they fear that ghettos might, um, might be created because of this. And so this is probably the typical picture you have from a social housing to a dwelling. Um, in German, I'm, I'm lacking the English word for that, I'm sorry, a Plattenbau. So something a really, a huge housing project that comes with a lot of um, social problems with it, a lot of people with problems are living there and personally I wouldn't want to live in there and I guess neither of you would. So this is what a lot of people have in mind when they think about social housing can also look like this. So this is an example from Frankfurt for example. Um, so even today, even though the number decreased, but we are regularly building new social housing and those projects kind of are, they, they can be nice, they can be modern. Look at Vienna, there are a lot of really nice buildings, are social housing buildings. Um, but still, um, the, the public perception is not that good. So the media portrays that poor renters cause trouble, um, especially conservative party, fear that more social housing dwellings will, will create problems of ghettos, um, and especially higher earning people are blocking social housing. So this might have several reasons. You could fear that simply the quality of the neighborhood is deteriorating. Also, if you are a landlord, you might think that you earn more money from, an, uh, uh, from the, the regular labor market from a luxury um, building. So there are several reasons why um, social housing is declining in Germany. One thing that we know from the literature is it might come with problems in terms of crime. So there, there's a quite recent literature that looks at the effect of social housing on neighborhoods, especially in terms of crime rates. And what they find is there seems to be a positive effect, to, or at least a positive relationship between social housing dwellings created in highly dense urban areas and crime rates. Now, when you, when you control for the income level of the neighborhood, then this effect might even become negative. So it, it really depends, and you'll hear this a lot um, in the next 50 minutes, is it depends on where precisely those housing projects are constructed. So um, especially from the American perspective, a social housing project might be in a really problematic, dense neighborhood. And there, it might cause additional problems. But when you get people out of those bad neighborhoods, then you might actually alleviate some of those problems. And this is something we should keep in mind, also from the German perspective, where the share of social housing buildings <coughs> is comparatively small. So we have a lot of space where we can, could place new social housing buildings without having to put them in the, in the poorest neighborhoods of our cities. So this is not really the neighborhood, um, the, the, the literature that we relate to. There's also a recent literature on economic effects or on labor economic effects of social housing buildings. Probably the one paper that is closest to what we are doing is the job market paper um, by Winnie van Dijk, um, who looks at a public housing lottery in Amsterdam. So also the, the whole lottery is fairly recent. So what she, what she could only do is look at very short run effects within the, uh, the first one to two years. And what she found is that at first there's a negative effect on working incentives. So people reduce the labor supply once they moved into those public housing projects. But this applies mostly to those people who already earned above a certain threshold and especially the poorest people. For those, the, the effects were opposite. And there also, um, Winnie van Dijk found that um, labor supply even increased after moving into those social housing dwellings. Um, then there's also a couple of papers from the United States. Um, so there's a whole strand of the literature looks at teenagers and their outcomes at age 26. And what, what they do, they compare teenagers who lived in social housing buildings and stayed there with teenagers who also lived in the same kind of buildings, but then moved out of there um, because they were offered social housing, uh, sorry, they, they, they offered 
public housing vouchers um, by the government. So they were free to choose where to live, but they got, they got their rent subsidized. And what they found um, is that also there was a negative effect on labor supply for those people, but it again was most, str uh, was most strongly um, in social housing projects that were located in the poorest parts of the cities. So this might also be very specific to the American case that social housing projects tend to be located in areas that, are, that have problems in several dimensions. Then another strand of the literature, um, both in economics and also in sociology, looks at, at neighborhood effects. So does the context of where you live, do your neighbors, does the whole environment have positive or negative effects on your specific outcomes? Um, there are two papers that use also random allocation or lotteries of where people, when people are allowed to live in social housings. And one is from Denmark, the other one is from France. And they look at effects of the neighborhood composition once in terms of the share of unemployed people in the neighborhood and the other in terms of um, the diversity um, then, um, by, by ethnic groups of the neighborhood and how this affects economic outcomes of the people who live there. And they, they, they showed that living around a lot of unemployed people also reduces your probability <coughs> of getting employment, but the, just the diversity of the neighborhood does not seem to play a role on um, individuals' economic outcomes. And then a last strand of the literature that I should mention that we have also heard before from um, Raoul is the um, literature around the moving to opportunity experiment in the United States. Um, this experiment has nothing to do with public housing, but here people who lived in really poor neighborhoods were offered um, housing vouchers, and, but they had to, in order to, to collect the money from those, vouchers, from those vouchers, they had to move out of the poorest neighborhoods into economically higher ranked neighborhoods. And what, what, what this literature found out was that there's not really an effect for adults. So if you're an adult and get out of your poor neighborhood, you take all your social ties with you. You barely socialize with the, with the richer people in, in, in your new neighborhood, so there are barely any positive or negative effects. Something different applies to their children. So Chetty, Hendren, and Katz found out that really children benefit from being taken out of those poor neighborhoods and taken into, into higher quality neighborhoods, into higher in, uh, um, income neighborhoods. And so this, this whole literature on how strongly your neighborhood affects your own outcomes is also something that we relate to with our paper. So in, in this paper, we first of all want to show the overall effect of living in social housing on labor market outcomes. And what, what we find is, is that the probability of being unemployed is reduced after people move in social housing, even in the long run. They, have, they are more likely to be employed, and they are less likely to switch jobs. So they, they get more stable jobs. The probability that they stay in their jobs increases. And we also see that it's not only employment, it's also wages that increase. So they tend to get better jobs, so the wages increase and the overall labor income also increases in the long run. Then, yeah? Can I ask you about the, so the social rent and housing? Is that more of a story of like uh, the lower classes of Germans? Or is it, for example, uh, refugees who also go into the social rental housing? So it's, and, and what would be the like, proportion of each? So and it's also, sorry, second question related to that. Uh, for example, in Italy, uh, when uh, refugees were arriving, they were put in social housing, but they were not sort of like one big social housing where everyone was. Mm -hmm. But um, the local government sort of owned like one apartment here, one apartment there. And that's interesting because then they're sort of the only refugees then in a, in an apart in a building of... Yeah. Uh, other Italians living there. So is in Germany also that an option or are all the social uh, rental housings like separate buildings? Um, so first of all, it's not simply a, a story of Germans, it's a, a story of people living in Germany. And, of, and so the composition of people living in social housing 
reflects um, the, the whole group of, pe of, of low income, of people with low income. So uh, the, fr the fraction of non-Germans in those social housing projects in Germany is, is, is around 60%. So it's, it's definitely not only um, low-income Germans, um, but it's not refugees. So the, the, the way that refugees were allocated in Germany, there were two, so for those who did not find housing on their own, who, who um, needed public housing, it was either in, in special housing projects that were built for, for, for refugees, um, or it was on the private market where the government then paid for the rent of those people. But it's not, it's not the, um, those buildings that we have in mind here. Okay, so Refugees are all of the story, yes. Thanks. I'm sorry, the second question? So it was the second question. <laughs> if in yeah. Germany you also have a system where you can own uh, you know, one apartment in a building that's not social housing, but that, that uh, apartment no, it's, is social um, it's in, in, I'm, I'm getting to this later on. Yeah. So the, the way how this works is that if you are a developer, so a person who builds um, a multifamily building like the one behind here, then you can apply for, at the government for, for subsidies, and they would subsidize you, uh, you building uh, um, this building, but then you have to commit that you only ask a rent up to a certain threshold for this building. So only, then you can collect only the rent that you need to cover the running costs of the building for the next 25 years. And in, in this regard, I'm, I'm really not sure. So we, we observe entire buildings. We do not observe mixed buildings where normal people and, and and subsidized people live in together, but I'm, I'm not sure whether a developer can build a bigger building and then let's say, um, num like this here then, the, for example, that they look like one building, but um, that they in fact are according to how they're registered are two buildings and one is normal, one is subsidized. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure about this. <coughs> First of all, there are developments where at least this is intended that a share of uh, maybe entire buildings in a certain new de newly developed area is social housing together. Uh, some mixture of people living there. So maybe, I'm not sure about the house level, but I'm sure there are many settings where this is a specific goal. And the second, uh, you can have mixed buildings because for some people, they may run out of the binding, so the right. Or no, because the the the, 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 the 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 binding is on the on the level of the apartment uh, on the level of the building. <coughs> so the whole building is um, is a social housing building for 25 years, and then people uh, then families move in and out of those social housing buildings, and then when it runs runs out of this uh, um, this binding, then um, you can th then rent it out on the. Um, on the, even on the if somebody is not eligible, then he can't move in or she cannot move in. Yeah, okay, these are details. I, I thought this would be possible. So, but, so what, what, what we do observe is um, those social housing buildings are not located in, in the worst neighborhoods. It's not that there's a concentration of social housing buildings, but rather the story that, that you also said is, is true. They are located in, within normal neighborhoods. And so exactly this is the story that some bigger projects are built and part and some buildings within those projects are considered social housing buildings. Some of what we observe is also that buildings were renovated and then um, became social housing buildings. Um, but so what we do not have and what we do not observe is that mixed buildings. So that really in the, within the same building on different floors, they are subsidized and unsubsidized people. This might have changed um, with the, there, there was a regime change, but we are looking only at dwellings of the first regime that were very homogeneous houses. Okay, so we, we first of all look at the effects of living in social housing at the um, at labor market outcomes of the people living in there. But then we go one step further, and this is also beyond um, the existing literature, and we try to get into the mechanisms that drive those effects. And here, we have three candidates that we can um, analyze further. And one is that social housing in Germany provides you with access to the urban labor market. Because rents within the center of the cities, where the good jobs are located, where the good accessibility um, is present, are really expensive. And so too expensive for low-income households. But social housing provides them with a possibility to live within 
those cities and benefit from um, also the labor market amenities provided by those cities. Another explanation is stability. So when you live in social housing, you know that you cannot be evicted um, very early. You can even, so you might still run into problems if you cannot pay your rent. You still run into problems, but there are a lot of reasons why your landlord could kick you out in a free market um, dwelling. Something like if they want to, if they renovate um, this place, then they can, can collect a rent or ask a rent that is too high for you to, to be able to afford, so you will move out by yourself. Or the landlord could say it's for, his fam for her or his family, and then they can kick you out. This does not happen in a social housing building. So this provides you with a lot of stability, and that's the center of your life. So it reduces, it takes away a lot of sorrows from those people. And finally, and this might also be the consequence of the first two, now those people have resources left that they can, can invest in their human capital. And what we find is after moving into a, such a social housing building, the probability that um, people go into a vocational training increases dramatically. And then finally, we also speak to, to the literature on neighborhood effects because we, have, um, we know the addresses of those people and of the people living around them. So we can really see, is there an effect of the composition of the building itself, so of your neighbors inside of the same building, or um, of your neighbors in the same housing block? So let's, let's look at the institutional setting. How does public housing work in Germany? As I said before, so as a developer, you can apply at the government to subsidize your project. But then you have to commit that for the next 25 years, you collect the rent that is called the cost meter, the cost neutral rent that covers the running costs. But um, you won't make much of a profit from that. The profit comes from the subsidy. It's binding for 25 years. So after those 25 years, your building stops being a, sub, uh, um, a public housing building. And so this is what drives this decline in the number of public housing buildings. Simply they stop being, uh, being one, so some, at least some of those landlords were then eager to rent them out on the, on, on the, on the normal market, on the regular market, whereas no, not that many new buildings um, were constructed during this time. So there's, there was a change in the regime, and at first this is what we were actually after. So for projects that were approved in 2001 and earlier, they were approved according to what was called um, the, the Erste Förderweg, or first funding road. And this, is, uh, um, this, uh, this makes very homogeneous buildings. So there was a certain threshold, conditional on your individual characteristics, and if your income is beneath this threshold, then you were eligible of moving, of, of getting one of those subsidized um, apartments, and if you then, if, if then your labor market situation improves, then at first there were some modest surcharges, so, so you had to, to pay a slightly higher rent, but this was abolished in 2007. So the probability that you were kicked out, even though your labor market situation improved, was very small, and because there was only one eligibility threshold, there it's a very homogeneous composition of the building at least in terms of who moved, moved into this building in the first place. Then, for projects approved in 2002 and later, it's what they called an income-oriented system. There were all of a sudden three different eligibility thresholds, and the rent also was, uh, could be raised um, if your income increased. And so those buildings really differ in their characteristics, um, but for our purposes, it's really too difficult to look at those, the second kind of subsidy because those buildings are very heterogeneous and also the rents were not kept at a certain level. So that's why we focus on buildings funded according to this first funding route. So how do people get access to those buildings? First of all, your, in, your eligibility in terms of income is checked. So you have to file um, an application and state your net income, and then interestingly, you even have to state your employer 
and the city government would contact your employer and ask about your income and ask about your employer's expectations about your future income. So they really wanted to make sure that your income was low enough to get in there and also stayed low enough for the next two years. And then you had, you had an apl applicant status for those two years. There was still a huge bottleneck. So last year in Munich, for example, there was a waiting list with 22,000 households, but only around three and a half, uh, half thousand households um, uh, vacancies where those people could be allocated into. So in order to get on this list, um, you had to pass, you had to, you had to have an income beneath a certain threshold. So there, of course, are different thresholds um, for singles and couples, and then each additional, additional child also raises this threshold. Nicely, in real terms, this threshold really didn't move much. Um, but of course, there can be differences in the composition. So there can be like single mothers with many children or um, couples with, with only one children. So there are different ways of falling beneath this threshold. Then, Anna? Is the threshold only controlled at the beginning? No, it's not checked anymore. Yeah. How does work for people who are unemployed? If you just finish your studies, could you wait a year and not have the income apply and then get a cheap apartment for your life? Um, that <laughs> so that's something we want to rule out in our identification strategy because this is a concern that we get people who write are finishing their education or shortly before finishing their education and they just by construction must be on an upward tra trajectory. So I'm, I'm not sure how this is this officially ruled out. We rule it out in our, in our empirical strategy. And also, I mean, these are cheap apartments, but it's still, you can do better in terms of quality of life. And, and so if, if, you're, if you are economically really well off, then there's not much reason staying in those buildings. So if you really succeed in life, then I guess then even though, you, um, even though the, your income isn't checked, but then you eventually would move out. So being beneath this threshold here gets you on the list. And then there's a number of criteria. You can download a list from the city governments. Um, here's the list for, for the city of Munich um, that then ranks those people on the, um, on the waiting list. So most importantly, is homeless people or people who are threatened of losing their accommodation. So if, you're, if, you're, if a contract is terminated, then it can also move up on this list. Victims of domestic violence, people living in severely overcrowded buildings and severely overcrowded accommodations. So um, a family with three children living in a, in a one bedroom apartment, for example. Health problems, then with smaller, um, with smaller priority, also if your housing cost is a huge burden for you, um, if you want to form a new household, and then when you have children, you're also getting moved up on this list. So of course, this is not perfect. We basically, if people have, are victims of domestic violence, for example, these, this is something we cannot control for. So the probability that they succeed on the labor market is probably out of our control. Um, but especially be um, overcrowding and the, um, the threat of losing your current ac accommodation is something that also people from those city governments told us is really something that is considered a priority of moving people into those subsidized buildings. Okay, so what do we do in terms of the empirical strategy? We use, we combine two sets of administrative data. One, uh, one is on social housing buildings and the other one is our great IAB data. Let's talk about the interesting data first on the social housing buildings. Um, and here, this, is, um, this was really an, an Andreas idea and um, Andreas achievement that he contacted um, every social office in each major Bavarian city. And so more or less he asked them to provide him with data on their social housing buildings. And it turns out that those city governments are really eager to learn something on, on what they are doing. And they were really eager of, of sharing the data with us. So we, we got basically Excel spreadsheets with or lists 
with newly constructed ho social housing buildings. So we don't have the full universe of social housing. What we do is those who have been finished between 1997 and 2007. But for those, we have the full coverage in the eight cities of Munich, Nürnberg, Regensburg, Ingolstadt, Augsburg, Fürth, Erlangen, and Würzburg. So really, every city government of those cities cooperated with us and provided us with a list of those buildings and with the addresses, most importantly, of those buildings. We have a few more characteristics of those buildings. Um, but for us, most notably was the address and under which funding regime they were funded. And so it turned out that in the smaller cities of Fürth, Erlangen, and Würzburg, they only um, had buildings under this second funding route, which is not that interesting for us. So we ignored them. So basically, our paper is a story on Munich, Nuremberg, Regensburg, Ingolstadt, and Augsburg. And you can see, of course, by the numbers. So in bigger cities, there are more of those buildings. And Munich, which is the biggest city and also has the tightest um, real estate market, here we also observe um, about half or more than, more than half of all, all buildings. In our data set, we have 465 social housing objects. So we had some characteristics of those objects, and we had the addresses of those objects. And, um, and this we matched to our employer-employee data at the IEB. So I, I guess I don't need to tell you that much about this data. Uh, Dana Müller introduced the data to this. So we used the integrated employment biographies of the IAB, which gives us the full population of all persons that have ever had business on the labor market. So either they were employed or they were customers at the Federal Employ uh, Employment Agency. For those, we have the entire work biographies. And we have also in a, su in a supplementary data set called the IEB GEO, we have their addresses. We have both the housing addresses and we have the precise workplace addresses. Now, unfortunately, we cannot simply work with this data set. So we cannot simply download it on our service and then do the matching ourselves. There are, there are very high hurdles um, for, for security reasons. So first of all, we had to apply for doing this. We had to, to check with our data security department. And they allowed us to do this project. But we had to make sure that we cannot re-identify people and places. So we had to provide them with our list of social housing buildings. And they made sure that there's a lot of variation in there, that in every city there are at least um, three buildings, or four, even four buildings, with similar characteristics. So that we, um, knowing the characteristics, you cannot identify the people living inside of those buildings. And then we could upload our list um, to a secure server at the IAP. And they then, and then we matched the addresses of those buildings with the addresses um, in our IEB data set and identified all those people who have ever lived in one of those addresses for the entire, uh, for at least one day in the period of 2000 through 2017, the period where we observe the addresses in our georeference data set. And so for this, we got little less than 10,000 individuals that have ever lived in those buildings. And for those people then, we observed the entire employment histories. Um, we reduced the data set a little. So we were only interested in people who were between 14 and 60 years throughout the whole observation period. And we made sure that we had no people who were in college when admitted to the social housing or who did not have a previous address before moving into the social housing. So we wanted to get rid of homeless people. And also when a person um, got a college degree in our data for the first time during the period shortly before or after moving into this building, we also, we also got rid of those people precisely for the reason that you suggested, because we wanted to make sure that there are no people who were on an upwards trajectory anyway. Then we again took the 100% sample of our data and looked at the neighborhoods. So for each of those social housing addresses and for each person who moved there, for each previous address of those people, we drew a circle with a radius of 500 meters 
and calculated average characteristics of all the people who lived in the neighborhood of those people. So, so this way we can look at the quality of the neighborhoods before and after moving into those social housing buildings. <coughs> Now, our empirical approach is very similar um, to what we've seen before. It's an event study design where we use staggered rollout for identification. So basically, we only look at people who have lived in a social housing project once in their biography. There's no control group of people who did not live in a social housing project simply because it's difficult to assess where, where they lived or in which, under which circumstances they lived. So our whole identification comes from that some people moved earlier or in different times compared to other people. Now in, in, the, in the last couple of years there was this very active debate on event study designs and what is the appropriate estimator for that. Um, we are using the estimator by Borosiak, Hall and, no Borosiak, I think Hall and Spies, um, who is very similar to, to the one we've we've seen before, so the idea is here that you estimate a two-way fixed effects model but only with data in the years before moving in. So specifically, we only use pre-treatment pre observations up to, up to two years before moving in. And with this data, we, we estimate the parameters and then estimate um, counterfactual outcomes for the people after moving in. And then simply we compare the actual, the actual data with the counterfactual outcomes that we got from the estimation of the pretreatment period. So the key assumption here is that there is no, no pretrend and no anticipation effect. So people did not change their behavior in order to get into those public housing buildings or in anticipation of um, going, uh, that they would be going to move there in a short while. So specifically, we are estimating the following esti um, regression. We regress outcomes only of the pre-period on individual fixed effects and interaction of age or year fixed effects interacted with city fixed effects, nationality fixed effects, and gender fixed effects. So for this, basically, we, um, we can control for um, the future um, so the future earnings profiles um, according to the age and the time where those people lived in, and this specifically for nationality, um, gender, and specific for each city. And then the treatment effect is then simply the average difference of the observed data with the counterfactual. Now this is our baseline effect or the, our baseline estimation. So here you can see the counterfactual and the observed data of people, of, of, um, of earnings, of people who moved into social housing. And here you can see it for the five years before moving in and the 12 years after moving in. So first of all, if you look at the, the pre-period, then you see there's not much going on for the observed people. And our counterfactual seems to capture this pretty well. And then they are significantly deviating from what the counterfactual would suggest. So earnings are significantly higher compared to what we would have expected if, you, if they would have stayed on that trajectory um, without moving into social housing. So there's a positive earnings effect of moving into a social housing project on total annual earnings. Now, this could have several reasons. We all know earnings are a function, or are, um, are a function of um, wages and the probability or the time in employment. And the time in employment itself could, al could also have an extensive margin and an intensive margin. So the probability of working at all or the duration of work. So the, the missing piece that we unfortunately cannot observe is hours worked. That's something we would love to observe. Um, but what we can distinguish is the fraction of a year that a person has been unemployed and 
um, whether a person has been unemployed throughout the whole year. And so here you can see that the total effect on employment consists of both. So people who move into public housing are employed for a larger fraction per year. And this effect is persistent and builds up over time. Interestingly, there's a small time lag. So it doesn't happen at once. It's not that they improve the situation on impact, but rather it takes two years and then they seem to, to increase their employment. It takes even longer, takes up to six years to see an effect on the probability of being unemployed for a whole year. So for those who are really further away from the labor market, it really takes some time until we can see any positive effects here. And that might be also be a diff uh, one of the reasons why, we fi why, why, why our effects, why our findings differ um, from the study by Van Dyck, because she looked only at very short-term effects where we can look at the long-run evolution of those people. Now, in terms of wages, the evidence is less significant, but we can again see that the counterfactual meets the data quite well before. And then there's a, there's a, um, there's a break. And so before that, they were on a downward trajectory so that the job quality was deteriorating over time. But then they improve. After moving into the social housing dwelling, they um, collect higher wages compared to what we would observe um, from their previous observations, what we would expect from their previous observations. So this is full time wages here. And you try to decompose the total gains in terms of earnings into the extensive margin being employed or unemployed, uh, intensive margins and the hourly wage or the daily wage here. Do you try to decompose it all? You mean a real additive decomposition of those three here? No, we haven't done. Yeah, all the margin, you know, 20% is coming from higher daily wage to 50% better, like uh, increasing employment and, uh, and the rest in the intensive margin, the number of hours or, or they would. Uh, not yet, also because we can't observe the, the hours worked. And also wages, as, as Hannah hinted, we only observe wages for people um, having full-time jobs, which also is a selective subset. We observe, we observe earnings also for people with part-time jobs. We simply don't know whether how, how many days per, per week they are employed. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really difficult to say something about part-time wages with our data. So are these uh, all those really the same uh, kind of general area? Is it the way I uh, understand the correctness of it? These are like basically the same city, but you get uh, maybe a different like, part of the city, or can actually come from you know, nearby town. Uh, I'm, I'm showing this, uh, you this in, in two slides. So what we can't disclose is a map of where those buildings are. We, maybe we should something. We, we should try to somehow make the course this in, in, in some way and then show you the areas. But what we see is um, those buildings are they are within the cities, but within the cities they are all over the place. So it's they are, they are not focused on specific areas of the city because that that was one of our fears. Um, that they would be located in, in, the, in the shabby neighborhoods. Um, which is, but, but really, since the, uh, the mechanism here that any developer could, uh, could apply for this, um, th this really means that they are scattered all over the city. But this also provides us with heterogeneity that we can exploit later on. OK, so we've done a couple of robustness checks. I don't know whether I should skip this in the, for the sake of time. Um, so most importantly, let me, let me pick out two of them. One is um, we were afraid that there might be something around graduation. So those people might either graduate from college um, or graduate from vocational training. So re we removed everybody who ever participated in a vocational training in the five years prior to moving into a social housing project. And also because still there might be some transitory shocks that people simply for a short period throughout their career 
might have low earnings due to several reasons, but they might expect to, uh, to improve after that again. But the, this might be still long enough for them to apply for a place in social housing. So what we've done is we constructed the counterfactual only from observations that were five years or more before moving into the social housing, housing buildings. And then, then those event study graphs look a little more fuzzy, but the overall conclusion stays the same. And still, um, the pre-trends are matched pretty well. So the, again, the counterfactual matches the observed data pretty well. So let me now take the next 10 minutes to talk about mechanisms. So what explains this result? Why are people doing better after having moved into a social housing? Now, our prime suspect is that it provides, a social housing provides them with opportunities to live and work in major cities, especially Munich and Nuremberg. So we know that there are more job opportunities. We know that better, high, more higher paying firms select themselves into cities. And we also observe that matching of workers and firms is, big, is better in bigger local labor markets. So there are a lot of reasons why people, also low income people, should benefit from living and working in big cities. And we can see that um, people who moved into social housing projects um, improved in several dimensions. So what we see is the distance to the city center decreased by on average 24% for when they moved from where they lived before into the social housing project. The number of jobs increased by around 6% in the vicinity. The distance to public transit decreased to live within walking distance to a public transit stop. And here, um, at, to any public transit stop increased as well. So the location of those projects are more favorable. Now the question is, now we know the, the locations are more favorable, but, but still do they matter? We cannot see this from this data here. For this, we look at the heterogeneity of the treatment effects. So the treatment effects, as I showed you before, is the difference between the observed data and the counterfactual. And what we did is we look at the long run effects so from 5 to 12 years after moving in. And we divided those by the average pretreatment difference between observed data and counterfactual. And this is our long run treatment effect for individual I. And then we did a regression of those long run treatment effects on several observable characteristics of those people, especially their age, the city where they live, and whether they have vocational training. And our main variable of interest are measures for the, access, uh, the accessibility of their um, new housing. And what we find is they, seem, they do seem to matter. So um, the shorter the distance to the city center is, the higher are the income gains because of moving into social housing. So the, the bigger is the effect. Um, on the inv individual income. We also find a positive effect um, of the number of jobs nearby. And we find a negative but not significant effect of the distance to the next public transit stop. So then the closer you live to public transit, also the more you earn. But this is not statistically significant. We find a little bit of significant results when we look at the unemployment effects. So especially for, in order to reduce unemployment, it seems to matter to live near the public transit network. Something interesting we also found out when we look at commuting distances. So do people exploit their access to the, to the network of employers in their city? And there's an interesting difference between men and women. So what we see is that women, after some of the rather short time, reduce their commuting distances. So once they move to the city centers or closer to the city centers, they exploit the fact that they are now located closer to a larger number of jobs. They seem to change their jobs in order to reduce commuting. This is in line with a lot of studies in urban economics that show that especially women are really reluctant to commute because it takes time away from them they could otherwise do for, for care duties. <coughs> 
for, for men, we observe the exact opposite. So men increase their commuting distance. So at first, this is surely because they mo move residents but not jobs. So they now, since they moved away from where they lived before, they now by construction have, or mostly by construction, have a longer commuting distance. But then, they, unlike their, their wives, they, are, they do not reduce their commuting distance, but they stay commuting further. And interestingly, we still observe that they change, uh, change jobs around here. So later on I show you that we do see a lot of job-to-job -job transitions, but even though people change jobs, they do not change to closer jobs. So in, instead it seems like they still, they simply make use of the public transit network. They live closer to the public transit net network and then they use it, even though if it means they have to commute to the other side of the city. Okay, let me go through the other mechanisms. So another mechanism is residential stability. Now you have a dependable place to live and this reduces uncertainty and this increases the probability that an investment pays off, both for you and for your employer. And we really see that moving into a social housing reduces your, or living in social housing reduces the probability to move. All Bavarian, the probability to move from one year to the next year in all of Bavaria is 9.5%. And this includes homeowners and, um, and people in, in, in rural areas. But then the share, uh, the share of people that we observe that move is 6%, so considerably lower. You can also do this more formal. What we also tried doing was we compared two groups of residents in social housing. Once, uh, one group that moved into social housing between 2001 and 2005, and we compare this with people who only moved into social housing 2012 or later, but already moved into a different apartment, a different non-subsidized apartment in the same time between 2001 and 2005. So this way we created out of our sample of people who eventually live in social housing, a treatment and a control group, and then we compare the probability of moving out again. And what we see is that those people who, like 10 years before moving into social housing, when they moved to a different apartment, the probability to move again within one year is extremely high. So more than, less than 40% of those people who switched to apartment are left one year after. And after 10 years, basically no one lives in the original building anymore. And now compare this to people who move into social housing. So they are less, a lot less likely to move to a different place once they're into, in social housing. And this seems to pay, pay off in terms of investment into specific human capital. Now, we also looked at the outcome of job-to-job -job moves. So here we've done the same event study as before, but now the outcome is the dummy variable that indicates if a person moves to a different job from having an employment. And we see that at first there's a positive effect. So at first, right on impact, people seem to search for a new job that is probably more conveniently located or paying a higher wage. But after that, the probability to move job again is dramatically reduced. So residential stability really appears to translate into job stability. Now, the final mechanism, yes? Do you also look at the type of firm people move to? For example, are they more likely to move to a higher again fixed effect as to lower again fixed effect? That's something we, we, sh we should still do, yeah. The quality of jobs. We, we once looked at, at, uh, at tasks. They found, there we found we, they, they moved to slightly better jobs in terms of more, um, less routine jobs and more cognitive or or um, interactive jobs. So another mechanism might be that m living in social housing frees up resources. It is cheaper compared to market housing. So those people have more resources and now l l you have to uh, imagine these are people who earn a very small income. They have families to take care of. So earning even a lower income while they are in vocational training might mean that they um, they cannot afford caring for the family anymore, so they might simply be reluctant taking off a vocational training. 
Once they live in social housing, they can do that. On top of that, it pays off to invest in human capital once you know that you don't have to move again. And also the access to the urban labor market provi might provide them just with better um, vocational training positions. So there are a lot of reasons why people living in social housing should invest in um, vocational training. And what we've done is we looked at those people, only at those people who started out not having a vocational training. And then we simply did a linear probability model and regressed the probability of taking up a vocational training on an indicator that shows us whether we observed them before or after moving into the social housing project. And so on average, those people have a probability of 8.5% to start an apprenticeship. But this increases by around one quarter, a quarter, after they move in their social housing projects. So quite a significant effect. Now, now that we've pinned down, or at least have, I hope I, that I could have convinced you that there are several mechanisms that, um, that explain why social housing improves employment biographies of people. Now let's look at the, the last facet, and this is um, the neighborhoods. So does it matter where those social housing projects are located? There are several reasons why it might matter to live in a good neighborhood. So people who are, have employment might refer uh, to, uh, their jobs to you. They might be good role models. It simply might be a safe or a clean environment for you and your kids. Now, we cannot really examine those different reasons why the neighborhood might matter. But um, since the allocation by the city government does not allow people to choose where they live, um, we have sort of random allocation of people across those social housing projects. And so people cannot choose their neighbors both within the housing project or their neighborhood, but we can observe those. And then we can observe the quality of their neighbors and see whether this affects the strength of the effect. And so we did the same as before. We calculated the average long run effect of those people who moved into social housing and see whether those effects depend on the median daily wage of the, the wage of their neighbors, whether the neighbors are un, um, unemployed, the skill level of their neighbors, and the nationality of the neighbors. And what we see in terms of earnings, we see positive effects of the wage. So living near people with better jobs increases your own income. And so this is, we can observe both the quality of the neighbors in the building and in the neighborhood. And so we can plug them into the equation um, simultaneously. So one is conditional on the other. Conditional on being in a good neighborhood, it's still on top of that matters if your neighbors in the same building are also of higher quality. Then your chances of, heading, of uh, your, um, your, your income outcomes are reduced if there are a lot of unemployed people, especially in your own building. They're also reduced if there are a lot of low-skilled people and a lot of foreigners. So we, we don't know about the mechanisms here, but we can repeat this here for our individual outcomes. And what we find is that for wages, especially the real wage of your neighbors matters, whereas for employment outcomes, so for employment probability, the share of unemployed and the share of non-Germans matter. So in order just to get a job out of unemployment, seems to be important to have somebody to be able to refer his or her employer to you. So here it simply, it helps if your neighbors are not unemployed or if they themselves are arrived that much um, that they could refer their jobs to you. And this seems also to, to be more difficult for people who have recently migrated into Germany. But if you're already employed and want to have a better job, then it matters to live near other people that have good jobs or that live near people that um, have high qualification levels. And is this random allocation also given for families so that kids would have to switch schools? Um, yeah. So it's, I mean, to, to the best of my knowledge, they, okay, so that's a good question. <laughs> 
actually. So, I mean, they, they get allocated to where there's a free apartment. And so when, when the question is, do you want to move, and then also move school, or do you want to stay where you are for longer, then I guess for most it's, it's easier to, they might be willing to move to the, uh, to the new place, and then also the children have to switch schools. Okay, do you have, do you still have? One minute. One minute? Okay, then, <laughs> then let me conclude. So we do find positive effects um, of having access to social housing. We find that the probability of people to be employed increases and their wages increase. And so it seems to be a matter of having access to the urban labor market, of investment into, um, into training, into vocational training, and um, of the stability of your, of your surrounding. And so one question is why do we find different um, results compared to other countries? And one of the major differences is where those objects are located. So it really matters not only to live in social housing, but also where you live, with which neighbors you live, and what the accessibility of this is. So it's really important to locate those social housing projects at favorable sites and not just anywhere within the city. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>